Shalom party people and welcome to the 12th Sea. I've got Mr. J.D. Stone rocking on my left with what, 35, 40 pounds, something like that? Probably, I added a little bit. Okay, so you, you may be up to about 40 then. No, 36. 36, cool. <laughs> that is a good place to start. And myself, par used with the 64 pound bag, eight, or 19 and change pound vest, so 83 pounds, give or take. And I mean, I've thrown an accoutrement or two on there, so we may be pushing close to 85, 84. But either way, it doesn't matter. Well, the other day you were carrying that big old sack too, so you were pushing 100, right? That was more than the other day ago, but yeah. It's been a little while since I've carried more, but either way, I did ask Mr. Howitzer Hill uh, to bring to the refuge ruckus uh, sandbag that they filled full of gravel to let me carry it for part of it. So that'll be additional weight at some point. But anyway, so Mr. G.D. Stone and myself were chit-chatting on different things. And the uh, <clears throat> topic of Percy Jackson and the Olympians and all those books came up and we were talking about the expansion of the West and how what was it? The uh, the spirit of the West has immigrated over to America. Yeah, that was a big part of the first book. Right. Is that... A little soapbox about it. The argument was the spirit of the West started in Greece and then it moved to Rome and then it moved to uh, Britain. Uh, they're very vague on the timelines. Right. You know, Great Britain had it for a while. And well, and it may not it may not be that it was exclusive to an area. Yeah. It could have just been, in general, the spirit of the West has been migrating. Yeah, um, and they, they actually did, you know, make a case that the, the actual physical locations, like they moved Mount Etna to uh, the east, the west coast. Right. You know, things like that. But, well, so ge geographically they expanded, too, right. because if it was exclusive to Greece... You know, your square footage wouldn't get past the Appalachian Mountains. Right, you're very small, but, you know, the spirit of the West. So, and right. We, and we, we, we would say if it was in the British Empire, well, yeah, that was huge. Well, the sun never set on the British Empire, so. Right, so. Yeah, but the. Until we nuked Japan, Hiroshima, boom, roasted. Nagasaki, boom, roasted. Yeah. But, well, anyway, so you could talk about American colonialism there, as well. right? But we, we're definitely <laughs> just as colonial as the British ever were. It's just we call it different things. But yeah. anyway, it's nation building now. But yeah, it's, we're a little bit more subtle about it. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, the the idea was um, people still worship Zeus and still worship Hera and. And Hermes and uh, Athena, all, but they're not by those names, obviously. Right, it's more of the concepts behind them, uh -huh. the the fact that, well, I think Neil Gaiman hit the nail on the head with the American Gods book. Yes, um, which I haven't read, but um, it's 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 like Percy Jackson, but for adults. Yeah, I feel like I like. I need well, actually, to, I think Percy, Percy Jackson's was American Gods, but for kids. Yeah, actually, because I'm pretty sure the American Gods story came out in the '90s, if I remember right. Sure. But he's the main dude is the son of um oh what's his name Odin. Okay. But he doesn't know it, and. It's not really clear if he's an iteration of Thor or not, um, because he does have some control over the weather. Uh -huh. But he, like, it's emotional based, and he doesn't always know how to tap into it. Right. Um, and he doesn't even know it exists for the majority of his life. But they point out to him, "Hey, when you're sad, it rains." Yeah. So. The Men in Black Two. Yeah. <laughs> Which I wonder if Men in Black Two got that from there, because. Sounds that like book it. was around. Yeah, sounds like it. Anyway, um, the the concept behind the American Gods thing is that uh, because of our desire for you know commerce 
an industry and we're never six we're never satisfied i guess is the word i'm looking for with whatever we're buying um that like the concept of the old gods is dying in america and the new gods of you know wood metal plastic um electronics television the internet um are starting to take root because people don't worship concepts of you know a weather god anymore they they dwell time in their brains goes to materialism and consumerism and right so you know, my contention is is that those, those a... things are still are still alive i mean they're yeah. the sex deities are still blowing and going because the nation is sex crazed right but the a lot of the old gods are dying out um and it's just new versions of them that are reiterating basically yeah. and the, the whole concept of the book is everybody worships something whether they really know they're worshiping or not it's just what's your what's your mind yeah and i dwelling uh, on david foster wallace who was not a Christian by any stretch of the imagination. Well, neither is Neil Gaiman, but yeah. Yeah. So David Foster Wallace said the same thing. That he further enumerated, if you worship vanity, say, uh -huh. you worship the way you look, you are always going to feel ugly. Uh -huh. And if you worship wealth, you will always feel poor. Uh -huh. If you worship you never power, have enough. you will always feel weak. And so to him... The trick was find something to worship that's not going to kill you in uh -huh. the end. And he never did. He, he committed suicide. Well, that does not sound fun. No. But yeah, I thought that was, that was actually pretty insightful coming from him because I'd heard that preached from the pulpit before. I had never heard an atheist say it. Yeah. That's crazy. But my, my contention against Gaiman would be uh, it's not new gods that we're worshiping. Uh, may, you know, maybe we shifted our focus and we, we don't have as much respect for uh, Thor because we figured out thunder. Uh -huh. We figured out how to protect ourselves from him. Not a big deal. But if, if you would, I don't know the, uh, the Nordics as well, but we definitely worship Hermes. Hermes was the god of uh, the roads, transportation, and commerce and uh, wow do we worship Hermes a lot here which is kind of funny I mean maybe going a little bit to Gaiman he was not such a huge deal to the Greeks but the Romans he was yeah to the Romans he was and well what was he was mercury to the Romans right but this same yeah that the, same idea and boy do we do it too our infrastructure is insane well, arguably, our infrastructure is crumbling, but it's still, it's what unites the nation. It's not as good as it was before, but gee, look at the, look at the interstates that we've got. Look well, and arguably, you could say the internet has been. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's information that's, that, that gets counted. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's considered in the infrastructure bills all the time, so I would say that there's yeah. an argument. Well, and, and how do those signals fly? Right. Uh, through the air. And that's also a Hermes thing. It is. He had those those winged sandals he flew. So we're worshiping Hermes a lot, whether we know it or not. And I, I'm, like, I'm not specifically claiming that Hermes still exists or ever did exist as an actual well, I would, entity. I would argue that all those deities did actually exist or do yeah those, um, those could be a physical because, manifestation of a spiritual because i i believe that they're either fallen angels or nephilim um, or whatever i think it's very possible that um, you have these these beings and you can call them aliens if your mind wraps around that better but fallen spiritual beings that come to earth and or superhuman, so there's religious cults that build up around them, right? And they move around from 
civilization to civilization and different civilizations focus on different attributes of the same individual. And so you have some crossover of, you know, hey, these dudes are similar. They have some similar origin stories. They have some similar superpowers, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever. Yeah, to the point where a lot of the cultures would take a look at different ones and say, Oh, yeah, we already worship that one. We just right. call her by a different name. Right. The one I would push back on that one would be, um, oh, what's your britches? Uh, Aphrodite. Uh, Aphrodite has a very specific character in the Greek uh -huh. and, and Roman tradition that does not cross over into Hinduism at all. Right. Well, and I'm or, not saying that it's just one set of, you know, a couple dozen of these guys. I'm saying right. that there's probably you know, a few thousand that were spread across the whole earth and they all have some level of interactions. And even if you're getting into the, um, they were destroyed in the flood, which they very well might've been, there's some extra biblical stuff that says they weren't. I don't know. I don't really care. Well, um, cause I'm, I'm still dealing with theoretical concepts mm -hmm. on this, but if they were, were destroyed and the new civilizations spring up, then you're just going off of stories. And going off of stories, you're going to get embellishments right. behind it and things are going to differ because you can have two villages next to each other sharing the same root story and they're radically different because stories change over time. So. Right. Well, and if, going back to Greece, you could hear a myth about Athena and Arachne, for example. And in Athens, uh, Athena is portrayed much more positively than in Thebes, where she seems kind of bitter and more vindictive. Right. So there is that. But I think the fact that some of these ideas keep on cropping up independently of each other is pretty interesting. Well, and I would submit that that spurs into the fact that I believe that they're fallen into individuals, you know, fallen angels, Nephilim, whatever. Yeah. Um, that they probably did exist at one time. Right. Now, Jordan Peterson would disagree, I think. Well, of course Jordan he, Peterson would intellectually disagree with that. Yeah, he would say that these are archetypes. You're right. That are kind of built into the human Plus. psyche, which way are we going now? Yeah. The, How much time do we have? Into the human psyche and... Um, yeah, we got to. So, and that's why they keep on cropping back up. But I would, I would say maybe there's some, um, some validity to that because I've been running into Gnosticism a lot lately. Uh huh. Uh, again, a lot of secular scholars are either outright saying this is Gnosticism, uh -huh. or they start explaining what's going on with. Uh, uh, different isms, you know, feminism right. or, or all these things. I'm like, wow, this is, this is body hatred and, uh -huh. um, and trying to transcend that body hatred. That's Gnosticism. So, uh, and, and that has been, Christianity tried to stamp that out and they did a very good job. Um, very good job at it. They, they destroyed and to, a lot to the secular scholars chagrin because they're like, we don't really know what the Gnostics said much because we don't have a whole lot of... You can reconstruct some of it from some of the comments in the New Testament, but you really... Yeah. You and, don't you don't have a great And we do have a couple documents, you know, a little partial documents. Like right. You've got the Gospel of Peter, for example, which is... Oh, Gnostic. Yeah. Yeah, very Gnostic. I think the Gospel of Thomas as well. The, the Gospel of Thomas, from what I understand, is a lot of Gnostic sayings. Yeah. So it, it'd be like if you had the book of proverbs uh, but for gnostics right and so it's very it's we don't really know what those original like the specifics of what those original gnostics did right but if you look at um history especially the church, history of the church and they will enumerate all the heresies that they were stamping out gnosticism just keeps on cropping up right. over and over and over again um, and they keep on punching it down and it just keeps on coming back. So either that's a very persistent demon uh -huh. or this is something that's built into humanity 
or both. Mm -hmm. You can't, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. But, right. But this idea that, number one, I, I hate my body. Uh-huh. I really, like, I really resent that um, I crave these things that I don't actually want to crave. And what I really think is I'm a pure spirit and I need to break my spirit away from the body. Mm-hmm. Combined with... Um, well, you think that that might be why a lot of people seek meditation um, as a outlet for themselves or whatever? Part of it, probably. Because there, there is an element of meditation where you're separating your your spirit being from your body and not like the astral projection sense, but it's just more of the, I guess, the mindfulness sense. Yeah. Is what a lot of people who are chasing the meditation, it's they're emptying their mind so that way they can transcend. Right. Um which I believe is demonic practice, yep. but not the meditation like we meditate on scripture where we're trying to fill yep. our mind with scripture. Totally different. Uh -huh. It's where they're legitimately trying to empty their mind. Yeah, that's that can be part of it. And then the, uh, the, on the philosophical, the more intellectual side of it, Descartes with uh -huh. his, his mind-body paradox. And you're like, you know, no, there's, uh, that's not... One, one scholar I heard recently said... Uh, Descartes had to be a man. Uh huh. <laughs> no woman would ever come up with this idea that her body is separate from her being like that. Now, if that same scholar is an anti feminist. And uh -huh. She contends that feminism is very much about hating your body and hating your vulnerability and uh, envy over men not having to deal with uh, that vulnerability. Gotcha. And so that's why they're trying to reshape the, the version of woman that they're trying to build looks a lot more like men while simultaneously trying to promote men to be a lot more like women. Gotcha. But, um, so that is, again, that's Gnosticism cropping up. Um, and then the other element you have to have with Gnosticism is, uh, in Percy Shelley of, he was a poet from 18th century Romanticism, uh, husband of Mary Shelley who wrote Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. He would independently came up with a Gnostic idea, uh, Maybe Satan was the good guy. Yeah, I've heard people float that idea well, left and right. Well, it keeps on coming up and up. Yeah, it's not like it's an exclusive idea to, like, the Church of Satan or, no. you know. No, but, it, like, it's, it's a well, persistent idea. I would say that it's a, like, just in our storytelling, it's natural to want to root for the underdog. It's natural to want to root for whoever is not in power. Um... Like, that's just a, a storytelling archetype, I guess, if we want to throw Jordan Peterson yeah. out there, that you're always going to have a percentage of the population that even if someone is morally reprehensible, they'll, they'll root for the opposition. And I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that that's a fact of right. life, that and, and you will have a group of people who side with the opposition even if the opposition is is pure evil, it would be. It's it's natural also to to be a little bit mad at God, because according to that myth, the you know the Genesis three uh -huh. myth, which I would submit as history, but right, but God, God throws Adam and Eve out of the garden just uh -huh. for gaining the knowledge of good and evil, and curses them. Well. What it, it's not so much throwing them out of the garden for gaining knowledge. It's not that he didn't want them to know. It's for the disobedience. Right. Is what it is, is I give you a set of guidelines that those guidelines sound like I'm trying to restrict your fun. It's I'm trying to keep you alive um, because the whole concept of Torah is the preservation of life. It sounds like a horrible idea to restrict people on certain things. But if I'm telling you where the fence is, because outside of the fence, there's death out there and you may not die instantly, but you'll, you will die. I'm trying to give you those boundaries for your own safety. Right. And they're violating that boundary. So it's now, Hey, I'm putting a new form of hedge of protection around you, but you're still going to die. It's that he's prolonging 
that for them. And it's not just, hey, you, I'm kicking you out because you got smart. No, I'm kicking you out because you were disobedient. And that disobedience is leading to your destruction. And I was trying to keep you from that. Well, but they, they read that as, as God's pestilence. Right. There's a lot of people who read it that way, of course. Um, there's, a, there's, there's no reason they think that Adam, which, by the way, is literally man in right. the Hebrew. It's so, the word for man. You're correct. So that's why I... That, that helps me think maybe this is archetype or an archetype yeah um, but well and there's be... and there's room for the the in the faith for the first 11 chapters of genesis to be allegory right there there is room for that like you can still be within orthodoxy right and believe that i would submit that it is history but and i don't like, see i don't it's see not a, why it can't be both it's not oh, right oh, it's not a salvation salvation salvific I can't talk today. It's not a salvation issue. Right. Uh, I would submit that it's more important than both sides say it is. Right. Um, and I would agree with you that I think history can be allegory. So, going back to that, coming back to no, that you're, money trail. You're good. Um, they don't see a reason why Adam and Hava, which is literally e, uh, life. Right, yes. Um, so, couldn't life exist? of man. Couldn't continue to exist in the safety and wealth of the garden, right? While still knowing about good and evil, right? But I think, I think that maybe God wasn't necessarily cursing them, like, like applying something that didn't have to apply uh -huh. because he was mad, or even because he was trying to keep them safe from some other more dire evil. Uh -huh. I think he might have just been describing, okay, this is just the natural consequence of what happens when you know about good and evil. Uh-huh. I'm not... If we, if it was it's going to be a struggle when you know about good and evil. Right. I, if we're going back to archetypes, I'm not sure that the Garden of Eden was actually as safe as they thought it was. It's just that knowing good and evil, they were able to see consequences maybe their their eyes were open to what was already right. out there and so now now that they are aware of okay now what i do causes bad things it used to be i would do i would do these things and then other things would happen and you just roll with the punches and it's fine but now you can say oh i can shape my own destiny gotcha and now wow and adam says i don't have to pick food uh -huh. one day and then it's not there anymore the next because another animal got it uh -huh. or you know I, I ate all of it yesterday I can plant now well now that you know that you can you're gonna do it right well but that was part of the curse though is he had to work the ground exactly and that's that one his... thing these are the natures of the curses um, now like you you gotta you gotta do that. Uh, you, if, if you know to start growing your own food and stockpiling it, that's definitely something you should do. And that's something that civilizations across the world have done over and over again. You have this move from hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which some cultures still do, right? but they're not very big. Uh, transition to light agriculture, and all of a sudden, that's when you can start to get bigger and spread your influence more. Well, yeah, and you have the, the collective nature of people getting together, and that's when they start chasing other things, and that's right, what circles... Start worshiping other gods. Right, that's and that's, what, that's what circles back to where we were going with a lot of this, is that you have people who, they get distracted by the things and not by the creator, and they're chasing the created instead of the creator, uh -huh. and all of a sudden you start getting into concepts where it's not that they're truly like directing the forefront of their brains to commerce. It's that commerce rules their life. Right. And so whether they're intentionally making sacrifices to a deity or they're all consumed by the overarching of the acquisition of 
wealth and resources by the sweat of their brow and their their time and their thought and energy and effort uh, um, and not that they're manifesting it going oh i want to be rich and they're rich the next day is that they're setting their mind on the task of hey i'm gonna hustle and grind yep i'm gonna worship this thing and, and it's not necessarily an intentional choice but how are you spending your time right. um arguably you know by your time in your checkbook i can show you who you worship right. so because where a man's treasure is there his heart will be exactly also. so to put this right back on the rails of where we wanted to go with this in the first place uh you mentioned when we had the beginnings of this conversation before uh the aries wasn't a big deal now aries being the god of uh pitched combat right and i disagree because in, in america uh -huh. because we had these wars uh-huh now they're not here no, they're not here. Uh, and so that, that would be where I would supply that Aries is not necessarily at the forefront. You know, I mean, but I guess everyone who is signing up to worship him is going anyway. So right. who knows? Right. And they're like having served. I know that there are absolutely people who do thrive on that. Like They just want to be in combat. Yeah. Well, there's a certain aspect of the male mind that enjoys the struggle. So Right. And But see, Aries slash Mars always was kind of held at arm's length by most people because he's not a very good god no. for uh building and, and and influence and stuff so he was very much worshipped by the legionnaires mm -hmm. and not all of the legionnaires either because athena was more right. more prized by the ones that were warrior poets yeah well yeah and your, well, your centuries that's where you get for your... sure was more into athena than Ares. right but if you're the joe if yeah, you're the guy the grunt, holding the, the sword and carrying the shield, learning how to do your turtle formations and stuff, you want to honor the god of brutal combat because what's that saying? Your all of your plans disappear when the first fire a bullet is fired or Something the first like punch that. is thrown. Yeah, Athena yeah. goes out the window yeah. at a certain point. At least for you. Now to Caesar, no, because he's you know he's got his his soldiers moving here and there and his units, and he knows that he's going to lose a few here and there. But you know he accounted that; that's in his plans. No big deal. It's a big deal if you're the guy. Makes sense. So um, we still worship Ares. We still worship Athena. Um, she's also the goddess of architecture, by the way. Right. Um, so, well, I would say our architecture as a society has definitely gone downhill. Yeah. So. Yeah, so Athena's prestige is kind of deteriorating a bit. I mean, where, where would you think that the, the peak was? The peak of American architecture? Yeah. I would say, I don't know when it peaked. I can tell you it stopped, like, altogether. I think it stopped in the 70s. I think it peaked long before then. Yeah. I would say the building of the Empire State Building was definitely a heyday for sure. It's a big achievement. Yeah. It is. Um, and I'm not saying that like the Freedom Tower or anything isn't an architectural marvel. I'm just saying that like we're not churning them out anymore. Yeah. Or uh, the Chicago, <laughs> the Chicago Tower, Sears Tower. Yeah. Um, I read a book about the World's Fair, Chicago World's Fair. It was pretty popular. It's called Devil in the White City. Uh -huh. uh, mo most of it was about the Chicago World's Fair and all of the uh, the innovations they had to make that happen. Um, quite a bit about the Ferris wheel. So, bringing up the Chicago World's Fair, mm -hmm. there was, and I'll have to find the video, there was a ritual done to Molech at one of the Chicago World, World's Fairs. Really? They, they said it was like a play or whatever, but it, like, it was a bunch of, like a bunch of pagans who got together and they erected a legitimate statue of Molech. And they danced around it. And like, I mean, it was like, it looked like Bohemian Grove type shit. Yeah. Is what it looked like. I was like, oh my gosh. And like, it was in living memory. Um, there's, there's film footage of this. And they're like chanting, and they, I mean, they have audio 
and it, it took place at one of the world's fairs. I don't remember if it was in the 60s or the 70s, but. The Chicago World's Fair was at the end of the 18th. Well, they, st 19th they still have World's Fairs there every so often. Oh, do they? But like the big one, yeah, I know what you're talking about. There was also one in St. Louis, I think, after, uh -huh. in the 1930s, I believe. And that, well, that's where the St. Louis Arch comes from. Uh huh. And uh, that's another architectural well, and it, achievement. And it is actually a monument to the spirit of the West. Right. So, and westward expansion specifically. Right. So, you know, bringing that spirit across the massive land continent that is North America. So then, uh, here's another good one, Apollo. Uh -huh. Apollo was the god of uh, the sun. I mean, he, he kind of shifted his sun duties from Helios. Helios used to be the god, and then somehow Apollo adopted those things. But he also, so his prestige in that would be much diminished because we're we're now post Copernican. You know, right. We, we know we know a lot more about the sun than we used to. Breaking new ground with that one there, Copernicus, yeah. to quote one of my favorite comedians. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, but uh, uh, art was his, and entertainment was a huge thing. He had, he managed the muses. Uh -huh. There were nine of them, um, and they they were in charge of things like poetry, well, epic poetry, uh -huh. which I consider my fiction to be more uh, in line. Calliope was, was the one, and I have... I have jokingly uh, said maybe I should sacrifice a goat to Calliope when I had writer's block. Well, that sounds like a horrible idea. I'm just saying. <laughs> I but. would never actually, but well, is, here's the question though: if you're if you're dwelling on it, like not that specifically, but if you're if you're desperate for the inspiration and your time and treasure spin on it isn't that a sacrifice at that point yeah a bit. and there are because you are you are sacrificing there are definitely people who do rituals right even to try and clear their mind uh to let the creativity flow uh-huh uh, and you know they're they are not burning candles necessarily although you could some people might be you could burn incense to help clear your mind you know you're not and there's always scientific reasons behind it you know we're we're very much post enlightenment, you know. We're we're very rational about uh -huh. it, but we're still doing these small, repetitious rituals to get the creativity going. You know, right. some for some people it's just as simple as you know you go to the coffee shop and you buy the same coffee. You know, now you're you're, you're taking mind altering stimulants. Right. Uh, which is also an Apollo thing, by the way. He also was the god of prophecy in his Pythia. Uh huh. She, and this was an actual person. Uh, growing up in what we, what's the equivalent of a monastery, and she would, po she would sit uh, like in living Greek history, like when when Persia invaded Greece. Uh, they went and asked the Pythia questions, and they have it recorded exactly what she said. Right. And these very cryptic, very weird prophecies that they would they would hear, and they'd be like, "Man, I don't even know what's going on with that. I don't know what to do with that." Right. But it would shape their policy uh, according to the way that they thought it, what it meant. And they would later say, oh, we, we either nailed it or we completely missed it. But they could see how that prophecy was fulfilled. Right. And these days we credit it to uh, hallucinogens, uh -huh. pro possibly, because she had to do it in this volcano. Right, where there was where like she, gases that came yeah, up. Yeah, she was and exposed it... to these things. And we're not actually sure which gases, you know, because it could have changed since then and all that right. stuff. But they're like, maybe she's hallucinating. And maybe we're just, you know, seeing patterns that aren't really there because humans are good at that and all of that stuff. And... To me, who's, I'm a little bit more uh, receptive to spiritual talk. Oh, I, I certainly believe that you're channeling a demon at that point. Yeah. And it's not the demons are all-knowing. It's just that they they have some level of insight into... And influence. Right. Influence, for sure. And shoot, maybe they do know, you know, because we don't know how time works. Well, 
you would argue that they're in at minimum a fifth dimensional state where time is less relevant to right. so they what's could going be, on. They could be able to look a little bit further back like we can, but also look a little bit in the future. It's, like, it's oh, possible. This is what's coming up. Yeah. So, you know, who Also, knows? if they just have an idea of what they're dealing with, I mean, you can, you can look at your kids because you know them so well and also they're a less developed mind and you can pretty well tell what's going on right. and like hey these actions are going to lead to these types of results yep. so if you're dealing with something on a on a larger plane i could see how that could play into it as well yeah and, i mean you, we're, we'll tell our kids okay you need to take a time out yeah right now and they're like oh, i don't want to and they're like well you're about to melt down I know no i'm not yeah. okay yeah, you're about to melt, so you need to de-escalate and you need to take some time. Yeah, we can yeah. we can kind of see the future in that sense. And yeah, maybe that's how it is. It's possible. I don't but, know. But so where the question is, do we worship Apollo? No. It's possible. Where where I'm going with it more than anything else is I think a lot of the, the lines in uh, Samuel and in Kings um, where it talks about the different kings of Israel being good or bad um, and that hey they you know they got rid of the bales but they never uh, they never got rid of the high places um, that the people were worshiping at or anything along those lines um, and I, I would argue that yes we have we have done away with the direct worship of idols um, inside of America for the most part I mean there's there's some of it's cropping back the up but I would say manifestation yes of I, I would say I would say in our society that we have kept the high places um, and that we we need to do a better job of rooting out what our what our time and treasure is spent on and that I would argue that America is more pagan than a lot of people are comfortable admitting so that Absolutely. that is where I submit that and, and, the, that goes, and the challenge of going and doing hard things is identifying what parts of our heart are not in lockstep with Elohim and saying, hey, examine me and show me anything that's in me that's not of you and help me to, you know, let go of the things that I'm holding on to that are ultimately self-destructive. Right. So that's that's essentially where I'm going with and it. And I think that else. it's very important to think specifically <clears throat> about which deities mm -hmm. you are worshiping. Yeah. Or if you don't, if you're not comfortable with saying deities, yeah. What what spirits? Yeah. Are because some people are more prone to envy. Right. Some people are more prone to lust. Lust. Yeah. Definitely. Some people are more prone to wanting to gather power uh -huh. and consolidate it because because they're afraid. Right. Or because they want to build up their own prestige. Right. And all of those are different forms of just self-worship. Exactly. So. 100%. And so I think it's important to know where you're vulnerable. Yeah, I would agree. Wholeheartedly. So that's the hard thing that yeah. I think we should all be challenged to do. Exactly. And on that note, go do hard things, everybody.